Hello, and this is going to do 9C, and this will finish up Unit 9 on Evidence of Evolution. First thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about what homologous structures are. These are structures of different species that actually have similar purposes, as well as look and function. And you can see we have the arm of a human, the front leg of a horse, the uh, front leg of a cat, the wing of a bat, the wing of a bird, and the flipper of a whale. And if you take a look at the color of the bones, the bone structures are very similar in all of these, uh, even including five. Uh, the horse actually had multiple toes at some point, but found a way that the one toe actually became larger uh, with the fingernail material on the outside. But even the whales got five, just like us. So what this is, these organisms are showing evolution. They're showing structures from maybe similar ancestors and actually moving from one four-limbed critter into everybody you see. So a bat, a mouse, a bird, and a crocodile, all being uh, four-legged. Then we have analogous structures. These are actually structures that are not built the same but have very similar function. You can see a moth. How do you tell it's a moth? Uh, you can tell it because of the furry body. You can tell it because of the type of uh, antenna. That's not a butterfly. Um, this is the uh, front arm of a dinosaur, pterodactyl. And then we have the front wing of a bird and the front wing of a bat. And there are those five fingers that we're talking about. Analogous bird and bat. Unrelated organisms involve similar structures because they live in similar environments. Um, they have to fly, swim, walk, whatever. Then we have what are called vestigial structures. These are structures that had a purpose at some time, but don't seem to have it any longer. Um, no longer required to survive. The appendix probably was part of a, our digestive system that actually helped with digestion of more uh, starchy foods when we eat more plant material, but right now it has no purpose. In fact, all it can do is kill you. Uh, humans have a tail, coxa, and we actually have this tail. Some people actually have the tail extended outside of their body, but we have the tail from time gone by. Um, we have a fish that even has the place of an eye, except that the eye is no longer functional because he lives in a cave where it's dark or she. And even whales, whales still have the back hip and leg bones that they had when they once walked the earth. But they've lost the usage of those. They've actually now internalized. In fact, it's actually no longer attached to the spine. So even if it did have appendages, they would be useless. And the spine on the whale, on a mammal, up and down motion versus the side to side of the fish. Then we also have camouflage, uh, where we have a sea dragon. Uh, looks like uh, an octopus sitting in there. A bird, it's me a bug looking like a leaf. It's better than a stick bug. And we have a praying mantis that actually looks like flowers. All of which trying to make it survive. Traits help an organism blend in the surroundings. The better the organism blends, the more likely it will survive to reproduce. And it can be actually trying to hide from things. Or it could actually try to hide, hide things because they taste good, or hide from things because they want things that do taste good. Here's an example of a uh, mantis, excuse me, not a mantis, a cicada. It blends in really well, and I don't know if you can see the moth here, it blends in really well as well. And the cuttlefish camouflage, and I'm going to show you a little bit of this one, because I think it's cool. A cuttlefish has taken camouflage to the next level. They can change their color, shape, and texture to blend in with the background. It's hard to believe it looking at these pictures, but all these cuttlefish are exactly the same species. They're simply changing their appearance depending on what's around them. It's called adaptive camouflage, and it's perfect for hiding from the predators Okay, and that's as far as we're going to go. 
I'll put these links uh, inside the comments for this video. We also have what's called mimicry. Mimicry is actually when one species looks very similar to another species. Viceroy um, is a butterfly that tries to look like a monarch. Monarch has a, because they live on milkweed actually, has a poison and if they um, are eaten, they taste really bad. So this viceroy actually mimics the monarch so that hopefully it won't eat, be eaten but, um, because they do taste good. We have the same thing with the coral snake and the king snake. We have the venomous black touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. Black touches red, you're not dead. I don't know what the saying is, so if I ever saw one of these, I don't know which one to touch, but I love catching snakes. We have stick bug that actually looks like uh, branches or parts of a plant. We have one, two, three frogs that are blending in with the leaf matter very well. And we have a moth that actually has these eye spots, called an owl moth, on these eye spots on the back wing, so that even when the moth is looking this direction, uh, something trying to sneak up behind it thinks its eyes and maybe think twice. The more one looks like another, the more likely it survives to reproduce. Then we also have fossil evidence, and here's where we talked about the horse. If you looked at a horse a long time ago, it actually had the five, and then it had went down to three, and then it has, still has three with one enlarging, and then eventually it moves over to the one hoof that we've got the tooth. Um, very similar because of the material that it eats. And this goes from the beginning of the uh, Cenozoic Age of Mammals through recent time, because remember, this is the age of the mammals. This is a trilobite. Trilobites are a very good uh, index fossil. They lived almost everywhere it was water, um, and they only lived for a short amount of time, and then we had the end of the Paleozoic, which they became extinct, and they're gone. Very much like a horseshoe crab, though. When an organism dies, it's removed from the environment as soon as, it, as, soon as you possibly can. Um, in order for it to be fossilized, something else has to happen. We also have to be able to get this thing to be buried very quickly. Um, this may show how species change over time as well as the habitat they lived, aquatic, the diet that they eat. Uh, we can get mouth parts. Um, we actually look at the tooth of these ancestral horses and we can see they still eat plant material. Um, as well as their function pretty quick and swimming in the water with a hard shell to protect it. Embryology, excuse me a second. Embryology, I'm going to show examples of humans, whales, chickens, and turtles. If you take a look at this as a human fetus, this is in the fifth week of development, a very prominent tail. We also have gill slits that are visible. This is the front arm. The back leg is just starting. Um, we actually have other species here, and I guess we're not going to actually show which one's which. This is probably the whale. Uh, this is another human. And then we have the formation of a chick. I guess that's the turtle. That's the whale. Yeah, I totally messed that one up. So we have a human, we have a whale, we have a turtle, and we have a chicken. And this actually is what happens when you don't look at these things for uh, two years. Because the last time I saw this slide was two years ago. Ontology, ontology is the actual course development for an organism from fertilized egg to an adult. Phylogeny is actually the evolutionary history. So you can actually say that ontology recapitulates phylogeny. So when we actually see the development of an organism, we can actually tell something about its evolutionary history. Here's an example. If you take a look at these, uh, we actually, do I tell you what these things are? Um, embryology is the study of embryos and how they develop with structure and function. The longer one resembles another, the more related they are. Right here, you can see they have eyes. They have gill slits. They have tails. I'm not exactly sure what these are going to end up being. Let's say heart. And then we go a little bit through time, and now they start looking a little different. Um, some of these start looking more fish or reptilian. Um, these guys still look fairly similar, and these guys look still fairly similar. Move a little farther in development, 
and we actually realize that we have a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, uh, I don't know which one that is. This is a lamb and a human, not sure what that is, but if you take a look, because we are fairly well related, um, actually we're fairly well related because of our similarity in embryology. Okay, we got a calf and a rabbit, no lamb. And then now that we have DNA and amino acids, we can do even more similarities. If you take a look, we have human and chimpanzees. If you look at the chromosomes, chromosomes are a little off, colors are a little off, but they're still very, very similar. Um, DNA and amino acids are compared to two different species. The more the DNA and amino acids they share, as well as position, um, the more closely they are related. Humans and chimpanzees. Uh, okay, here's pig, chicken, and fruit fly. And you can see there are quite a few similarities. Looks like the got some same thing there. It actually looks like the chicken and the pig are probably closer related than the fruit fly to either one of them. Phylogenetic trees and collatograms. So we're going to maybe make a collatogram. Um, using some materials that are pretty common. These are diagrams that show relationships of different species over time. Um, the way it works is we have an ancestral lineage here. It cuts this part and it actually has a speciation. If it continues up here, this particular species would continue. But because it breaks off left and right, this is a speciation event giving rise to two new species. So these are the descendants. Here's the ancestor. And you can see we had a speciation event, here's another speciation event, here's another speciation event. Number one was successful and lived all the way through. Two lived pretty long and three and four came about fairly recently. And if you actually take a look at three and four, three and four are closer related than either three to two or four to two or three to one or four to one because they're on that same branch. So the diagram shows relationship of different species over time, common ancestor, speciation events, and most closely related because that's shorter branch. Um, phylogenetic trees or collatograms. I think I'm supposed to talk some more. Um, this is actually talking about shared history for B and C. B and C more closely related. We have a common ancestor of A, B, and C. We got a common ancestor of B and C, and this is the unique ancestor of C as it changed through time. Uh, phylogenetic trees look like this. They do the same sort of thing where we have time going through this line and we have speciation events. And you can see here we basically to get to this branch we had a vertebral col vertebral column because the lamprey doesn't have one. And then to this one we have a jaw, and then we have four legs, and then we have the embryonic, embryonic egg, and then we have hair. And same sort of thing here. We start with a meat eater, and we start with go to a cat, and then to a panther, and then we go to a canidae, canidae so we go to the canis, and we go to a muscolid, you know, where we actually go to the musk creatures that actually have those scent glands. And again, these two are going to be more closely related than any one of these to any of the other ones. And these two are closer, more closely related. This one is the farthest removed because the speciation event was way down here uh, when we have order. The longer they resemble one another, the more they're related. Evolution for dummies. Um, you can take a look at this. I think it's actually a good movie, and I will try to post that in there. Ten minutes, I don't want to add that. And then the last phylogenetic tree and cladogram we're going to talk about is humans. Um, I really like this statue. What would happen if the monkey actually took, back, took uh, the, the right course? And I don't know if you can see this. There's a monkey looking at a human skull. I think my picture is right here. But anyway, that's, the roles are really reversed. And if you look at this uh, phylogenetic tree, we have a common ancestor. This is Australopithecus africanus. And goes up here and moves to this location. Um, also they had a speciation event here and this one dies out with robustus and bonsai. And then this one actually moves over and becomes a whole lot of different species. Um, 
all these guys become extinct. All these guys are the speciation events. And then we finally get all the way over to this creature that goes all the way over to Neanderthal, Homo Neanderthalus, and Homo sapien. This is actually a Homo sapien too, so we call ourselves now Homo sapien sapien, large brain case, but that's us. And if you take a look at this whole branch, do you see any monkeys? Man did not come from monkey. Monkey and man came from a common ancestor that was even before um, Australopithecus africanus. This is Lucy, uh, where we found a partial skeleton, so we know a lot about her based on the, the bones that she had. And then the last thing, this is a selfie made by a black, uh, this monkey species. If you just Google monkey selfie, um, you'll probably get this. Um, what happened is the monkeys saw the photographer taking the pictures. The photographer left the camera on the tripod and the monkey went over and took, um, I think, hundreds of pictures. And this is just one. A lot of them were out of focus. What the heck is the monkey going to know? But I think the monkey actually saw uh, his or her reflection in the lens and liked it. And smiles. And I think that's it for Unit 9. Um, so get ready with that study guide. Get ready for the test because it's coming. Bye-bye.